decided that Soul Doctor will be screening through Fathom this coming Tuesday, June the 13th. We have with us here today some very special people who are associated with this film. Uh, starting on the left is Dari Karlbach, who is the daughter of Rabbi Shlomo Karlbach. Um, in the center is Danny Wise, the writer and the producer of the film. And um, this beautiful lady is Lisa Simone, whose mother was Nina Simone. And as we begin, um, we're happy to take questions from some of the journalists in the audience and some of the men and women from around the United States. So please direct your questions, um, and we'll just start this process. Danny, tell me a little bit about the film. How did this come? I mean, I was working with you when this started off Broadway in 2008. Right, right. It was the audiences. I think uh, if if you're going to be uh, developing uh, a piece of of theater or storytelling, it's important to to really listen to the patients, especially if you're producing Soul Doctor and. Uh, it, there was, it was been, uh, you know, a celebration, a series of celebrations, uh, wherever we've been. And uh, we've been uh, throughout the world in, in different languages, and uh, everyone, I, uh, the, the, what they all have in common is that the show itself takes place in the audience. And I wanted to recreate that in a way that uh, could really be accessible to everyone who needs to hear stories as a community. And uh, so we really decided to work on a, a, a film um, that really had a special sound design that worked with the Dolby surround system in the movie theaters so that uh, the experience of the audience in the movie theater feels so live and so present uh, that when we started screening it in the movie theaters, we noticed, as it was in the, during the live productions, the audiences were jumping up on their feet and clapping and dancing and singing during the show. And um, that's really the impetus is we, we really wanted to see some more singing and harmony around this country rather than shouting and screaming. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so that's really what this movie is about. People think of a movie as a visual experience. This is really an atmospheric movie in the highest sense of the word. So I look forward to people coming and feeling it. Coming in and feeling it. So, uh, Ms. Simone is the executive producer of the film, and I'm wondering um, what messages are, are you, do you want people to take away after uh, experiencing Soul Doctor? Oh, there are quite a few. Um, I guess joy, starting with joy, inspiration, the power of community and coming together, and the fact that so many walls that we erect, whether it's through our vision, how we look different, how we sound different, different backgrounds. Underneath all of that, there's so much of the sameness that we all share. And I believe that's one of the um, biggest connections that my mother, Dr. Nina Simone, and Rabbi Shlomo Kalbach had in common. Within their differences, there was such a sameness that they recognized in each other, that they influenced each other, inspired each other, and they both went on to uh, be prolific presences in the world whose influence continues to touch the masses today. Thanks for that. We have a question from Beeb, um Ashcroft online. Uh, the play is based on archival research and interviews. What was that process like? And did you learn any new anecdotes or facts that you hadn't heard before? Oh, I love that question. <clears throat> um, it, the, the process of doing the research was so exciting as a dramatist because we were looking for his inner conflicts and the turning points in his life. And wherever we turned, uh, in the most... The, the least expected places, we heard uh, people who knew Shlomo and were affected by Shlomo in, in the most random circumstances, and those who were part of his career, and those who knew Shlomo and Nina Simone, and uh, throughout the world. Uh, and we, we did spend about three years recording and transcribing uh, interviews with people who were fellow students of his. We did archival research. We did research. Uh, through the Red Cross to find records in Europe. And uh, the, uh, 
Northwestern University has an extensive archive of the Berkeley Folk Festival in Haight-Ashbury during that time, which was just a wealth, boxes and boxes of, of uh, just undiscovered relationships, how, the inter how his life intersected and Nina Simone's life intersected really the powers of change and the ways of change um, during that whole era until today. And uh, when we really uh, were reading about Shlomo's only telling of his own life story, that's when we really discovered the turning point of his transformative relationship with Nina Simone. So, Dari, um, this is your father's story, too. I mean, what's it, what's it like for you um, seeing your dad portrayed on the screen like this? To me, my father is my greatest teacher because he teaches me continuously how to be true to yourself. You have to follow the calling of your soul no matter what anyone else believes or thinks or wants of you. And, um, his ability to transform the world started in the moment where he chose to live outside the box. And to truly live in your heart and your soul, you have to bravely honor that inner voice and break through the confines of what people think we should be and look like and act like. And I believe that the true magic between him and Nina was that they both chose that. They chose to break through and follow the transformation of what it means to touch another person's life entirely. And in that place, we um, break down the boundaries of love. And that's what the movie is really about. Beautiful. We have a question from Gaddy Elkin from the internet about the um, iconic fashion of Nina Simone and how it is showcased and reflected in some of the wardrobe choices. I think that's a Danny question. <laughs> well, that's interesting, actually. <clears throat> you know, the conceit of the play, which was uh, really a stage play that, that we captured uh, as a live performance, uh, basically it takes place in one setting of the House of Love and Prayer where Shlomo, as a troubadour, is telling his life story to his holy beggars, which are his, his <laughs> holy hippies. And uh, they become the characters in his story and through their imagination. So everyone basically does not have a, 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 that much of a narrative arc with their costumes. But Nina Simone, we really very much told uh, the phases of her life through her costume. And, and uh, it, it really was... Um, it, it, actually, the audience was able to follow the timeline and where she was in her life, uh, her journey through her costume, and I think that was also very true to her character, because I think her costume and her garb, especially as she uh, really uh, uh, reclaimed and was an, uh, an ambassador to her African roots, um, the costume became very much her expression, as much as her song was. So uh, there, there is a costume narrative for Nina Simone, and uh, a lot of research went into that, and a lot of stitching. <laughs> a lot of stitching. <laughs> Any other questions from the house right now? Can you tell us how the, the stage production, we had a question from uh, Dina Stewart online, how the stage production is different than the film? It's not, and the experience is, uh, it, it's, I think the, the difference is, is that uh, we're very proud of this and very happy that we have uh, the success, is that you feel it, it's a minimalist production, and therefore you really don't feel this divide of hundred million dollars of special effects coming at you. You know, you feel like you're, the, the story takes place in the center. Shlomo Kalba, for most of his career, would really perform from the front of the stage. That's why we're sitting here, and uh, not on the stage. And it, it was a theater in the round. We actually, on Broadway, we 
presented it as a theater in the round, and it feels like a theater in the round, um, and and the audience feels safe and part of it and spontaneously part of the audio, uh, of, of the actual theatrical production. So I hope I'm not disappointing you by saying <laughs> it's it's hopefully as as close to it as possible. Great, thank you. Uh, another question online from Beeb Ashcroft for Lisa. How did it feel to watch Naya performing your mother on the screen? I thought she was refreshing. Mm -hmm. It was really nice. Um, Mom's been dead about 20 years now. This is the 20th year of her transition. And so for me, who's perhaps one of the most biased Lena Simone fans that exists, <laughs> I was with the original, you know, so to be able to enjoy everybody's homage to my mother in a way that's not biased and to be able to recognize that this is their way of honoring her and bringing her to life. I enjoyed Naya's and I continue to enjoy Naya's rendition of my mother. Beautiful, beautiful. We have a question online um, from uh, Dean Stewart. Um, it's insinuated that he and Nina had a romantic connection. <coughs> How was that accepted by the family? Well, um, it's insinuated, but an insinuation is not necessarily a fact. Mm -hmm. So I think that the audience is allowed to come to their own conclusions as to what they think actually took place. I, Rabbi Shlomo was never mentioned in my household. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'll just say that as a fact. I learned about who he is when I met Daniel Wise in 2011 and saw this show for the first time. My mother had a life, she had a rich life, she knew many people, and um, I think it's better for us to just, um, can't say better, but in my opinion, um, as her daughter, I think that you can have, you can love someone, you can be close to someone, you can respect and revere and be in contact with someone without it necessarily going to the place that this particular person is insinuating could have happened. Good answer. <laughs> Good answer. We have a question from R.C. Samo online from Fanboy Nation. How many of the original songs written by Dr. Simone and Rabbi Karlbach um, are in the performance, and how difficult was it adding new songs to move the musical along while keeping the tone of the original works? Well, <clears throat> the Almost all of the music is Shlomo Karlbach's uh, melodies and timeless hits, I should say. Um, and the lyrics were written by our, our very gifted New York, uh, David Schechter, who is just a sublime, or he was the original director of the show as well, when you were involved. And uh, so we have created new theatrical songs, but the, they were composed by Shlomo. And then there are uh, several Nina Simone songs, uh, whether she composed all of them originally or if some of them are traditional, like Sinner Man, um, they were her songs because uh, she may have taken the ancient hearkening of a traditional melody, but everything Nina Simone did really was Nina Simone. And so you really feel that synergy, the musical synergy of Nina Simone and how it influenced this Jewish gospel, uh, this, uh, this Hasidic gospel, which was uh, so anomalous and so out of nowhere. Um, so when you're watching or experiencing Soul Doctor, you actually go through a musical journey. And you see a cross-section of this journey uh, between these two worlds and how when this cosmic forces of these great musical traditions collide, you have Am Yisrael Chai, you know. Got Shlomo Kawa. Any questions? Sure. I'm just curious because your parents were such good friends. Did you guys meet at childhood and did you guys become friends? Because I wonder if children of parents become friends too. Um, the first time I met Lisa was two days ago. <laughs> <laughs> Like we've known each other all our lives. <laughs> yeah, I, when I walked into the room, it was like instant. Like, this is my sister. Um, 
like a soul sister, and they say that energy can't be created or destroyed, and I believe that soul connections um, have nothing to do with how many times you met someone, whether you saw them in childhood, whether you know them on the street once or you know 20 years later. Um, an energy that lives between two people is sacred and always is there. And there's something that was created between our parents um, that allowed them to create something that lives in each of us because my father's in my blood and Nina's in Lisa's blood and um, we live through that and because of that and um, it just, um, it's just there. I don't need to add to that. <laughs> <laughs> I, can I just say something of my own experience? I um, I was here when the, these two very dear friends of mine met for the first time, and I'm sitting here between greatness, and uh, I really felt when they met. We went down for dinner, and uh, a few we had a few others with us there, and it kind of felt like we were watching Soul Doctor 2. <laughs> and I got for the first time really what this relationship was because of, not because of circumstances and backgrounds, as a lot of people like to talk about the Shlomo Nita relationship, which I think had much less to do with the different backgrounds and not to do with many other things that they had in common. But uh, they were just lost as, as really like sisters who were separated for life. It was like a corny Oprah episode. <laughs> but it went on and on and on for hours. And I really learned about the story for the first time in, in such a visceral way. And it's starting to affect me. <laughs> it's a very impactful question from Lauren Van Hemert. And I throw it to the three of you. Uh, with the uptick in anti-Semitic events in recent years and attacks on the black community, what's the significance of releasing this film now? And what impact do we think it might have? Might I, might I take that? Please. It's time. Yeah. Say it again. Mm -hmm. Say it again. It's time. Keep up, Moet. The time has come. Yes. There's no better time than the present. Everything happens when it's supposed to. We're here for a reason. And uh, a journalist asked me recently, she went on Wikipedia and was not able to find anything out about Shlomo. And she asked me how I felt about that because she felt a little some kind of way about it. And I just said, you know, it wasn't time. Now the time has come. People perhaps are more ready. Our community is ready. Our world is ready. We're ready. The production is ready. And it's being born in a manner that is shining a light upon it on a platform that cannot be ignored. And I feel that like a light, like a, a match to a flame. You see what's happening in the air right now? You see all this smoke is spreading across thousands and thousands of miles. I really f believe that Soul Doctor is going to have that same impact. And Lord knows it's overdue. So let us pray that since the time has come and the time is now, that the timelessness of this story, the strength and courage and fearlessness of these two individuals, the impact that they had in, on each other uh, within their own lives and um, that they continue to have from the other side will remain timeless and remain just as uh, powerful in the generations to come as it is right now. <laughs> I, uh, back in 92, 1992, I lived in the ground zero of the Crown Heights riots, which really is a milestone in, in race relations in general. And the, the accident had happened on the block, and I had seen weeks and weeks of, of anger that then boiled to bloodshed and it started to spread beyond the borders of Brooklyn and borders of New York. And uh, people do not realize from the inside that narrative, when did the Crown Heights riots, the race tensions end? And there was a moment when it ended. Shlomo Kalbach and Richie Havens. Mm -hmm. Shlomo Kalbach and Richie Havens 
they both called each other and they said they knew each other from way back and they were so similar. They said, we got to do a peace concert. And they just, uh, our friend Moshe Lieber, mm -hmm. put up a bandstand on Eastern Parkway. They blocked off the roads and tens of thousands of people came. And that was the end. Mm -hmm. That was the end of racial tension because they turned all the screaming into harmony. Now I'm going to fast forward. We started showing the film. We were invited to Selma, Alabama for the 50th Jubilee. I'm marching over the bridge and I'm hearing these young people singing these freedom songs, singing in harmony. They pass by the, um, the police. They say, I ain't scared of your jail because I want my freedom. And I felt so encouraged. We have to show this movie. And they loved the movie. And they were saying, the whole world needs to see this movie. Then I come back to New York after the shutdown, Upper West Side, and I see a whole group of black young people marching, Black Lives Matter, and we're marching together through the park, and we stop by the police, and they go, NYPD, flick my dick, or something. I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a four, it was a four word, a four word with four letter uh, protest song. And that's how, and it wasn't very conducive to polytonic <laughs> harmony, or social harmony. And I said to myself, you know what? Uh, what's happened is, and I came back from Selma so encouraged, and I said, there is no anti, so there are anti-Semitic incidents. And I remember what Shlomo Kabbalah said, he said, it, it was his theory, he believed that hatred came from anger, it was just crusted anger. And th the way to get rid of hatred is to fill our hearts with joy. And I said, I really am going to spread harmony across America until there's more singing together than screaming at each other. <laughs> And the Thank God Fathom events felt the same way. And we're going to do a harmony across America on Tuesday night. Yeah, that's good. My father used to say, um, if I had two hearts, I could hate with one heart and love with the other heart. But I only have one heart, so I only choose to love. And we're in unprecedented times yeah. where um, he used to say, there's nothing more holy than a broken heart. And our hearts have been broken over and over again to let the light in. And we're now at a place in our history where we've all broken open so many times that all we can do is rise in song and fill those broken places with harmony. And Rabbi Nachman used to say, if you talk and I talk, we can't hear each other, it's just noise. But if you sing and I sing, we create harmony. And our job in this generation is to create the most infinite, endless amount of harmony in ourselves, between um, our communities, between all of humankind. And the story allows us to create harmony in ways that, unexpected ways, and it uplifts and, and brings a whole new way of seeing the world. I think you probably got some good quotes there. <laughs> uh, yeah, I wasn't expecting to bring this up, but um, in 1999, I was uh, I founded a company called the Seminar Center, and I uh, had an event uh, actually called "Can Blacks and Jews Get Along?" And I had the, the two uh, debaters, uh, a guy by the name of Al Sharpton, and another guy by the name of uh, Rabbi Shmuley Botea, who wrote uh, "Kosher Sex," uh, and uh, it was an interesting argument. And that was on the heels of the Crown Heights uh, riots, but you know, my, my conclusion at the end of the day is, you know, there, there are incidences like the Crown uh, Height riots, which are isolated incidences. That's one incident. You know, it doesn't define anything. What really defines is is the unity, and, and actually, blacks and Jews have the history of unity, and going back to uh, the, uh, the, civil, the civil rights movement in uh, I think '63, when there was uh, two Jews and one black, they were slain, you know, marching together. Uh, I think Andrew Goodman, or, and, and you know, I forget the other two names. So, uh, you know, th this movie uh, really uh, inspires me, you know, to, to, un to, uh, to enforce that, that actually that we, we have more in common than we do, uh, you know, not. So I want to thank you for bringing this uh, to the forefront. Thank you for that. Um, Danny, there were some uh, controversies about Rabbi Karl Bach. And did these pro and con memories of the man that uh, uh, so affected Jewish music, which was so popular, um, how did it affect the film and the ways you felt about it? Yeah. 
I uh, I knew Shlomo as a child. My mother dated Shlomo until I was about six years old, and my father, who just passed away, blamed the divorce on Shlomo Kalbach. My mother blamed it on the babysitter. Points of view. But I knew so I grew up with Shlomo doing beans in the house until three in the morning, and the hippies coming over, and I would make fun of him with his guitar, Holy Beggar, you know, head, and uh, <laughs> I, I did not uh, see him until much later in life, and I ran into him, became close towards the end, had, had some close encounters with him, close, close moments with him, um, but during that middle period of my time, in the Orthodox and Hasidic uh, yeshivas, his music was absolutely taboo and banned. You could not yeah. sing Shlomo Kalbach music. It was rock and roll. It was drug culture. It was not modest. You had Shlomo Kalbach who was embracing women and men and homeless women on the streets who were 90 years old. And everyone he saw and met, uh, he was a free, loving, expressive, healing uh, man who fell in love with everyone he met. He was completely uninhibited. I would walk down the street with Shlomo, he was like on a shopping spree for homeless people. <laughs> he would be absolutely in, in ha ha Candyland today, walk down the street, <laughs> here, oh, I can give him a 50 or a 20, and uh, uh, sang to them and gave concerts to them. But Shlomo really made a personal decision, which was great conflict to him, of, of leaving the, or the strict orthodox context of teaching and spreading and reviving the Jewish spirit and also uh, contextualizing the Jewish experience rather than being kind of an imitation memory play of what the old world was in Europe, he really connected it to this culture, uh, to the culture and the world that we were living in and the living, breathing world. And I think the play very much talks about and contextualizes his personal relationship and struggles with the you know, European, German ideas of, of uh, which were not old Jewish Sephardic ideas. I'm talking about a particular framework of, of keeping the sexes completely apart, not shaking hands, and that separation, and how that evolved into him suddenly becoming a, a free-spirited, free-loving guru in 1960s Summer of Love. I think uh, you really contextualize that and understand who he was and what that whole relationship within himself was and his identity. So I, I think that we do hopefully understand who the person was more in the movie. And that's the most I could do. <laughs> Thank you. That question came online from Susan Rosenberg. Um, Dari, how, did, how does it, from, from B. Bashcroft, uh, how does it feel to see your father's message conveyed in the play, and how can viewers help spread the Soul Doctor's message of love and tolerance after they get home from the theater? Mm, that's a good question. Um, how does it feel to watch him? It's nothing but pride. Um, my father was born in, you know, in Europe and fled the Holocaust and was part of a great dynasty of rabbis. Um, but he was raised from the beginning with um, a huge openness for all religions. He used to talk about how in his house his father had the archbishop and the priests and the, like every possible religion coming in and they all came together and um, he knew, he was told from when he was three years old, you know, you're going to be a rabbi. And <laughs> he, uh, he actually one point took his kippah off his head, his yarmulke, and his twin brother <laughs> cried because it meant he wasn't going to be a rabbi and he just said he felt bad for his brother crying so much so he said, okay, fine, <laughs> I'll be a rabbi. <laughs> and. Um, in all his choices, um, as he led him, he was this great scholar and um, the highest level of understanding, depth in Torah knowledge. But every choice he made along the way reflects his big heart and his kindness. And um, I believe that his soul came into the earth to bring back 
the joy and the passion of Judaism that was lost on the Holocaust. Because he endlessly talked about the six million and um, how the six million angels are with us and we're walking through them. And um, the choice he was to bravely go to churches and um, be inspired by the gospel religion and like endless longing for connection to God uplifted something in this world. And so when I watch him and I see that he had this never ending heart to follow that and bring the loss uh, and the trauma and transform it into prayer and meaning and um, it just inspires me to want to do the same in my life. Beautiful. About two or three more questions. One from Darren Paltrowitz from um, Paltrowitz, yes, from online. Uh, Fathom question, Danny. Fathom is known for creating top-notch special events and screenings. Um, how did you know you wanted this film to be presented through Fathom events as opposed to a traditional national rollout? That's, I'm so glad you mentioned that. Fathom is a very unique phenomenon, not just as a company. Fathom is one of these, to me, the great cultural federation of America. People don't realize, and I've learned, I'm learning this uh, every day, that Fathom has, uh, is, is a content provider of high culture and individual culture to very different faith-based and different communities and micro-communities all throughout our country and in 45 different countries. They are so very involved and in touch with the micro-communities and uh, providing content for them. It's really the only and the last uh, organization in America that has that kind of a vision of bringing people to the movie theater because they look at the movie theater the way the movie theaters were originally built. There are community centers. They're where we saw the newsreels. They're where we uh, discovered live vaudevillian actors. So this is the campfire. They've really created the, the town square, the storytelling campfire places, large and small, all th wherever the people are. And that dream, I, Shlomo and Nina, traveled the world, wherever the people were. Most of the stories, you asked me earlier about discovering stories, I hear stories every day because people know I'm connected to the show. Just the other day at a cigar shop, this salesman was telling me how Shlomo visited him in the hospital, gave him a private concert in the hospital. He had a hernia operation, and his father asked Shlomo to sign his album. He said, my son is in the hospital with a hernia operation. He couldn't come. He said, let's go. And he went to the hospital and played a concert for him. And that's really the spirit of Nina Simone and Shlomo Kovov. They were there to fix the world, not to a play where there's a lot of people. We're in Fairbanks, Alaska, little town, Bethel, Alaska, islands throughout Hawaii, um, little towns in North Dakota and Indian, ter Indian territories, small little beautiful theaters, large auditoriums, and I, I really uh, would do anything I could. I, I really uh, just pursued this relationship with Fathom uh, until we really created this partnership and this message of Harmony Across America event at this time on Juneteenth, uh, as it's so, so needed. And it's Soul Doctor, and it's, uh, it's really a medicine, a medicine for today, for this year. So, uh, yeah, Fathom, I encourage people to go and, and look into Fathom uh, in general, the very, the content they provide and the outreach that they do. Can I take my seven-year-old neighbor, Levy, who's a yeshiva student, to see Soul Doctor in Kew Gardens? I wanted to come to the Kew Gardens Cinema, the Lesser's Kew Gardens Cinema, our lovely little art house in my enclave with my Jewish neighbors. I need that movie there so I can take Levy. We are going to make sure that it is there. Levy's seven. He's only seven. We have, do you remember in Jerusalem, we, even in, on AMC Times Square, they've never seen so many toddlers running around <laughs> the movie theater. When people ask me about the what is the young, you know, the minimum age, I say I, it should be a warning that the that there are kids in the audience. If you want a nice, quiet evening, in the audience, you're not. It's more like an LL flight to Israel. Dancing on your head. It's, it's not a makeup movie. It's really, really not. <laughs> okay. So
talk to you about Cleans here. We All right, please do, please. Really. Any other questions from the house? Um, I have a, a question, and it's going to piggyback off of what you guys have also already started talking about. My name is Richard, um, and I'm with an organization called um, Harlem CLX, which is Create Learning Experience. And my job is really to work on community engagement outreach. So my question really would be, for a young person that lives in Harlem, why would they want to come to see the show? And I know the answer, but I would like to actually hear it from you guys on what should I be telling them on why they should come and see the show. For me, who um, didn't really know Nina Simone so much until this show, just only that when I heard her sing, I vibrate, you know, because like the, you feel her entirety in every note. But something that um, I love about the show is the impact she had on my father. How something about the way she brought herself gave him permission to bring himself to. And um, to me that's an inspiration for the importance of how we understand how we impact, how just being so you, as a child, as a part of a, any community, how you impact the person next to you. And every time you bring your strength and your bravery and your power, you affect ripples in unimaginable ways. Like, if I don't know, if we sat and asked your mom, do you know that the way you sat and played piano would encourage thousands of Jews across the world to feel pride, which she know. She just was being big and uh, gave my father the courage to be big back. And we all have that impact. And uh, it's a gift to watch it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I think that um, considering my mother's background from Tryon, North Carolina, child prodigy, six of eight children born into a household that my grandmother was very, very religious. We have 13, up to 13 ministers in our family. And an uh, example of how committed to the Bible my grandmother was when I was 10 years old it was a Sunday I wanted to go bowling and she had to ponder if that was a sin. <laughs> and I remember saying, Grandma, I, I don't think there's anything in the Bible that talks about bowling. <laughs> you know, so to be raised in that kind of a household and... So Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> Did you hear what he said? It's so Jewish. <laughs> and so to be raised in that kind of a household and to have, and as the impression I get is that Shlomo kind of had the same kind of restrictions. There were these rigid rules that, that, that the elders held to. And for them to live within those households and then to reach a point within their own evolution where they said, we are going to find our own way. Um, and to be fearless enough and courageous enough to go against the teachings, against the rules, and even against, not even, a lot of times we, we want the blessings of our parents. We may lie to ourselves and say it doesn't matter, but I think everything, everyone in this room can say, when you do get the blessing, after you told yourself, fine, I'll need your blessing. Mm -hmm. And then when you do get it, there's this relief, there's this sense of, of rightness to that. To go against that, like my mom, one of her biggest laments is that she would always say that my grandmother was ashamed of her and that she put her albums under the mattress. Now the world revered Nina Simone. She had a great following, she had great influence, yet she would go home. And she wasn't Nina, she was Eunice. And she had to go back into that persona, into that box. And um, also the part of her that never healed with regards to her relationship to those to whom she wanted real blessings from. 
And as we sit here today, and we talk about this the influence that she continues to have, the friendship that she developed with this great man that is touching so many people of different faiths today. I say all that in a disconnected way and to try to connect it to say that we all have our own paths. We all have our own reasons for being here. We all have our own impact to have upon the world and on each other. And oftentimes we have to follow our hearts and not doubt what we're feeling even though we may be we may feel so alone <laughs> and and just wonder what is it that won't let me rest until I follow this path Shlomo did that my mom did that young people today are probably more confused than ever right. there's too much information out there. Yeah. there there's no childhood anymore uh -uh. and and so too much is thrown at them at too young of an age. There's more depression and suicide and, and sense of identity crisis. Oh, we, listen, we could talk about this all day. But our elders also were kind of saying the same thing when we were coming up. And so let this show be a beacon for those who are trying to find their way to trust their hearts, to allow themselves, yes, we're going to fail. Yes, we're going to make mistakes. But it's about brushing yourselves off, knowing that it's all part of the process, and that the greater you awaits you. If you just follow your heart and know that that is the beacon, that is the GPS, and we stand upon the shoulders of the ones who walk before us, and the best of our ancestors lives on in us. Trust that. Trust the love that exists in all of us, even though it may be buried under forms that do not feel loving. The love is there. And that we will reach where we're supposed to go. And that they are the future generations of this world, of this planet. And that all of us have a story to tell. All of us are stand upon the shoulders of our ancestors. All of us are equally important. And when we all come together collectively, we can make this place a much better place to live in in happiness and in harmony together. I have a specific Harlem. Uh, this the show really started in Harlem. The movie it was first discovered at the Kwanzaa Festival in 2020 uh, for Martin Luther King's Day. So someone had come to a screening and. Uh, it answered a great question of mine. Going back to the riots in Crown Heights, I was on a panel like this at Brooklyn College talking about my parents and how I grew up with civil rights activists. And my mother had a volunteer school for black kids, a core school, and, and a, a student from the, uh, from the black uh, student body with the Malcolm X glasses and everything. And, uh, and real uh, pride, he riveted me with the following cultured question. He said, if you're presenting this relationship as friends, why are you Jews always telling us what you did for us? And you're not telling us, what about what we did for you? And I, he, as a gentleman, and I was so perturbed by that question uh, for 20 years, really perturbed by that question. And I ha heard the answer, I, I, I said, I say to myself, I wish I could meet that fellow again and talk to him. Uh, I, I didn't have an answer to that question. I discovered the answer to that question uh, when we, in, in 2020, after the movie, a young filmmaker from Harlem came over to me and he said, you know why this is our story? Because this is, this is the first time we were respected, that you realize what we have to give to the world. This is about what we did for the Jews. This is about how black culture has revived the Jewish experience, which was a bankrupt. Quote your father, was bankrupt, completely bankrupt. It was worse than the first part of Sister Act. <laughs> this is a Harlem story. It's a Harlem story, and Harlem is the Jerusalem of of the African culture in this in this country. So. I really, uh, it's, it's meaningful to me that, that, uh, that this is being talked about and shown and told in Harlem.
happen. Do you think the kids would respond to this? Yes, they would. All right. um, and I, I agree with you. I think that representation does matter, and um, I really do think you have to trust the process. So, you know, I heard you loud and clear. Yeah, yeah. And the connections that you guys have talked about, how the film can bring about, and I think about, you know, when I was talking about Queens, um, cross-cultural experience for me, my classmates pouring Yiddish in my ear from a young age, <laughs> uh, being told not to speak it in front of adults because it was the language of the ghetto, of course, and I went to my parents who were from North and South Carolina saying, what's a ghetto? <laughs> Which brought about an entire conversation. <laughs> and so this kind of cross-cultural pollinization by two great, great people, I think of Rabbi Shlomo as a cantor, most of all, you know, because of my exposure to Jewish culture very, very young. I can still sing you the songs from Fiddler on the Roof because that culture was given to me very, very young. And then my father lied and told me that Queens College was built for me and that I had to sit Shiva for Goodman Trainer in Schwerner. And so it's very different. And this is why my neighbor Levy gets to be my date at the screening of Solda. <laughs> Can we introduce David? Yes, please. I have a great surprise for you. The true uh, conceiver, uh, who is you know the real man of theater, and my mentor and brother and co-creator here. Um, people tell me, "Wow, what a great book of the show! What a what a great story!" The story has gone up and down and all around, and it's basically very skeletal. The actors turn it alive, but what makes this a true piece of theater? Uh, the one person who really was able to collaborate with Shlomo Kabach on this, and Nina Simone, on this uh, on this movie is David Schechter, our my co-creator and lyricist, um, who was the first call I made when I was approached to write a show about Shlomo. And the original director of the show, from way back. Oh, I'm sitting in your seat now. Yeah? Sitting in my seat. I resigned. <laughs> Well, th this was great. I mean, I would say uh, th those are some really wonderful buttons. Are, are there any more other comments? Is there something you'd like yeah, to Yeah, I just want to say one thing, very simple, that I realize as it's coming over here, which is that both uh, Nina Simone and Shlomo Kalbach, they were both soul doctors, both of them. It's not just Shlomo who was a soul doctor. You know, she, and she was a doctor, even. I yes. <laughs> Doctor, of, a doctor. I don't know what her doctor was in, but I know she was. She got a doctor from Humanities. Okay, Humanities, and certainly her singing, um, and her music embodied that. Uh, but they were both doctors of soul, and in fact, in the first production, the first incarnation of Soul Doctor, it was a very rough um, uh, workshop of it. Uh, the idea of uh, uh, a street musician was brought into the story. And evidently this is the real story that I've heard anyway of how Shlomo got the idea of using music to uh, engage the uh, bankrupt Jewish uh, world and the people who, the, the young people who had lost their connection to Judaism. And he was looking for a way to do this and he was coming against all these walls. And then he was in the subway or on the street I don't remember ask, which, maybe you know the story. I ask Dari. Dari. But the way I know. <laughs> interview, interview the source. Yeah. Uh, do, do you want to tell? Do you know the story? I remember Dari. Or shall I just go? Sure. Okay, yeah. and I'll start it. So this is, this is, a, tru it. This is <laughs> a truth. It might not be the fact, but it's the truth. <laughs> <laughs> it's that he, he came across a woman who was singing, uh, a street musician, and I, I think of it in the subway for some reason, maybe because that's where I encounter these street music, these musicians all the time. And she was singing her heart out with this uh, gospel music, and he he was transfixed, and like he had this epiphany about um, this is what I need. This is if I could do that, but with Jewish texts that could enthrall people and bring them in the West, as much as she's enthralling me. And that this was a black woman who was doing this. And he went to her and he said, how can I do what you're doing? And she said, I'll teach you guitar. I'll teach you three chords. That's all you never, you'll ever need. Just three chords. You can do every song. 
that you ever want with those three chords. And actually, all his songs are basically three chords. What? <laughs> <laughs> That's it. So it's all. So really, she should be sitting here, and I should be standing there. So, um, yeah. So, so, and in our piece, originally that was how it was done. There was a black actress who was there with a the guitar. And he came upon her, and uh, he he gives her twenty dollars. And uh, actually, this is great. Can I, I'll tell the joke. Why not? Really? It's this great joke that Danny wrote. Spoiler alert! Spoiler alert! <laughs> that uh, that in the in the musical, the, the street musician is blind, and then he gives her twenty dollars, and she says twenty dollars, and he says, "I thought you were blind." She says, "I can see anything ten dollars and up." <laughs> <laughs> Like the best line in the show, just about. So, <laughs> Jim, I had, let me just finish my thought, okay? If I may. Sure. So, um, so uh, she asks him, "You must be a rich doctor, uh, you know, that you gave me twenty dollars." And he said, "No, no, I'm a rabbi." And she says, "So you're a soul doctor." Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's where the show got its name, mm -hmm. and that's where he became a soul doctor. And now, me, your your mother, yeah. Is, it's sold up here too, and here we are. So thank you. <laughs> Very nice. Thank you. Thanks everybody for coming today. Um, June thirteenth on Fathom Events around the United States. Yeah. Thank you all.